You're listening to the Teach Better Talk podcast featuring expert educators eager to share progressive tactics to reach more students. Teach Better Talk is created by teachers and fueled by passion. Let's get started. Welcome to episode 256 of Teach Better Talk podcast. My name is Ray Hewart. You guys know I've been hosting this podcast for 256 episodes. Um, I do have a co-host. He did decide to show up today. We have the Mr. Almighty, Jeffrey Raymond Gargas here with us. Hi, Jeff. Almighty. 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 Is that really the words you meant to say? Well, like that doesn't seem I felt accurate. Like for I you. was on a roll messing up the intro. I've been kind of playing with it these days, like trying to see how many different ways I can say the same two sentences about the episode number and the fact that you're listening to Teach Better Talk podcast if you haven't figured that out yet. So, you know, trying it out. Actually, at this point, they're no longer listening. So it's all good. You know what, guys? Have- <laughs> I know that you like to skip our intros and we we don't mind. We understand. However, this episode's so good. Don't skip the whole episode. Just skip the intro Don't part. Don't skip the episode, there's yes. so much goodness in here. And I personally believe yes. that you guys are going to be able to take away so many strategies that you can truly implement in your classroom this week, today, tomorrow. So anywho, let's talk shop a little bit. Jeff, we have some stuff going on and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so I had something that popped up. Uh, it was a conversation that was a ch- I can't remember. Honestly, I don't remember if I was having it with Chad or with Dave. Okay. And we we're talking about the, the this fear of people being a little too excited for things to go back to normal. Oh. And the fact that normal wasn't necessarily working mm. that great before COVID. And so this whole idea of we shouldn't be going back to normal, we should be going back better, we should be coming back better, and which made me think come back better, come back better, back better packages. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. It was just one of those moments where I'm like, Oh yeah, that's right. We do we already we have that kind of like that's what we're doing. So um, so can we talk about that just for a minute? Like, I would can like we share. To. I think that's okay, really you're important. Disag- you, you don't want to do this. No, it's not that I don't <laughs> want to, but your conversation made me think of another conversation. So can we do mine and then we'll go back to yours? We can do whatever you want. Like, oh, like I, I don't know if you know, but we're like, we're the, the, the host and co-host. I'm not going to say who is who, but we're the host <laughs> and co-host. So we can kind of do whatever we want. So here's what I'm thinking. I had a conversation about 30 seconds ago when we bumped into the ambassadors because they were doing a hangout. So can we do a really quick shout out? Huge shout out to the 31 new ambassadors that we just welcomed. 31 31 new ambassadors? 31 newbies. That's a lot. That's a lot. New ambassadors that we just welcomed to the Teach Better family. I just want you guys to hear a special shout out because we love you. And we literally just popped into the hangout to say hi to them. So I feel like the excitement is still like in me building up and... Okay, now we can go back to come back better packages. We, I think, we almost didn't make it here. I know, because we were we just wanted we to go say hi to late. them. I know. We were almost late. It was bad. It would have been just like 15 minutes of dead air time. That would be weird. Just- <laughs> I do have to say, though, I feel like these kind of go together because when we did the ambassador program initially, we did it because we wanted to celebrate, bring positivity into the world, amplify the voices of really great educators. And the come back better packages does that at a district level. And so to me, mm, yeah. like while I love that we both are able to reminisce on conversations we've had and celebrations we've had and really like look at the importance of educators being reflective, but also being celebrated. When I think of the Comeback Better packages, there's so many things that a district could choose to focus on, right? Like, okay, we want professional development to come back stronger in instructional design or in assessment, or in feedback, or in SEL practices, or supporting, you know, students with trauma. These are all things, these specialized areas that we can support districts in with a Come Back Better package. However, within all of that comes the celebration, the positivity, the solution-seeking mindset. I feel like these go together even though they don't go together, Jeff. I'm just saying. I'm good with that. I think they go to get better. Go go to better. Go to better. They go to better. Better. I'm concerned. They go together. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah. So everything's over at teachbetter.com slash come back better. Do we want? Do you want to? Do you want to share like what's all included in that? I'm trying to think of all the like. There's a lot included in that when we do that. It is a lot, and I won't lie, guys. Like I'll a, highlight it here, but you guys definitely have to go read on the website because there's a lot that's included in these packages. <laughs> yeah. There's. Because there's a kick, like a kickoff keynote day, right? Mm-hmm. There's a workshop. There's follow-ups. There's resources. There's 
a parade. There's floats. <laughs> there's confetti. There's fireworks. There's cake and punch. The it's marching like just band. Loaded. Don't forget about the marching well, band. Well, that's part of the parade. I mean, the, the 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 Teach Better Marching Band leads the parade. I don't know if you knew that, but we actually hired a Teach Better Marching Band. It's true. I'm just yeah. Uh, so some of what I just said was true, but you have to go over to teachbetter.com slash comebackbetter to figure out which parts were true. Thank God you didn't mention the tiger. That just really throws people off. <sighs> now everyone's going to be like, tiger. <laughs> we should totally get a tiger. We should get a Teach Better tiger. It it, it rolls so well off the oh. tongue. Uh, coming, to, coming soon, 2022, the Teach Better tiger. There we go. I like it. You've get, you've got a few months to like get good at training tigers. You know, I have anyway. I have two poodles. I feel like that's almost the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Are your dogs like that? They do growl a lot. Exactly. Like, maybe, like, is it like purr? Is it maybe a purr that they're doing? I don't. I don't think. I so. I think we're way off track. Let's talk about something better than this. Um, see, we're gonna come back better here by getting back to the topic of of doctor doctors Leanne, Lindsay, and Kristen. Uh, I just completely lost the name because I did the doctors thing, and I was so proud of myself. Um, but Kristen Madsen and, and Dr. Leanne Lindsay, uh, who are, I, I, I really like these two, these two women. Um, I've had some really good conversations with them. We met in clubhouse and had some great conversations and I've met with both of them at least once, if not multiple times, uh, individually. And then I have them both on a podcast. And it's funny cause there's multiple points where like, I'm pretty sure that we didn't need to be there. Because, like they were asking, they were like popping questions and back and forth. And we just kind of, you and I were just probably just like, like, you just go. We got this. You doctors got this. Um, but I really think we could. We were texting back and forth like at one moment because we were, you know, we do that. And you're like, hey, they need to be right in for us. So we're trying to get them to write for us. And then we we're also like, hey, we could do like six episodes with these two amazing women because they have so much to share. So like to me, that's all we really need to say about this episode unless you have something specific. I know we're both big fans of just digital citizenship and how important it is. And these two women not only are experts, but they are super, super passionate about it as well. I just want to encourage you guys, take a screenshot, share with your friends, and share it on social media that you're listening to this episode. We are at episode 256, and these episodes just keep getting better. So tell your friends about them. This would be actually a great one to do some sort of podcast discussion with a colleague or with your staff Mm. alongside because it really is about a topic that applies to every single educator. So share out that you're listening. Make sure to tag us, and let's get into the episode. Hey, what's up, podcast? It's Jeff. Don't worry, I'm going to get you right back in the episode. But I want to make sure that you are aware of our brand new series going on right now. And that is our Building the Grid Live series. This is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Chad Ostrowski, creator of The Grid Method, is going to be going live with a different educator and building a mastery grid. This is one of my favorite things to do is watching Chad work with an educator to unlock that creativity and create these grids. We have educators from all over the country coming in that are in math, science, reading, social studies, writing, art, PE, and even an admin coming in to show on the support side. The series runs from right now all the way until April 13th. That's every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, streaming on YouTube, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Twitch. Building a Grid Live every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Don't miss it. Now let's get back to the episode. All right, we are here. We are chatting with both Dr. Leanne Lindsay and Dr. Kristen Matson. And ladies, it is so incredible to have you on the podcast. We have connected before on Clubhouse several times and then also just connecting one-on-one with both of you and chatting through all the amazing work that you're doing and now the work that you're doing together. So I'm super excited to have you both on here and to just learn more about you and share, start sharing your story with the world as well. Before we get too far into that, how are you, how are you each feeling right now? Leanne, you want to go first? How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling great. I just really appreciate you, like all the advice that you've given us as we've talked on Clubhouse about, you know, how to really reach educators and all the great work that you're doing. And it it just feels great to be here. And Kristen, how are you feeling? I'm I'm doing great. Um, Leanne and I have, you know, just started collaborating this year. And um we are, we're a good team. We get along really well together. And so it's fun. This is our first podcast together. So I'll, I'll be interested nice. to see how we do. <laughs> oh, I think you guys are going to do awesome. I can already feel a good vibe. I think our listeners are already listening intently as they're getting ready for their day or maybe on a really good workout. So keep going guys. However, I have heard endlessly about how incredible you guys are as a team. And I want our listeners to learn more about that. So we're going to start with that kind of age old question of describing what you do, would you mind kind of answering 
what you guys do with education and how powerful this team is. Yeah. So Ray, I'm curious. I don't mean to put you on the spot or anything, but I'm just going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask if you have heard of the term digital citizenship. Is that term familiar to you? Um, it's extremely familiar, but I also want to remind you, um, I'm the podcast host, Leanne. You're supposed to be answering my questions, but that was a really good one. So do you want to take Jeff's spot and maybe you could be my new co-host? I like this. I'd love to take Jeff's spot. How can we make that happen? (laughs) Okay. We're going to talk about that later in this episode, but Leanne, yes. Tell me about digital citizenship because it's literally all I hear about. Yeah, because here's the thing. So I became like a digital citizenship nerd in about 2011, which was kind of before its time. And, and Kristen was, was right there with me. We we're kind of like the only two digital citizenship nerds. And at the time, I was working at the College of Education at Arizona State University. And I would literally go around from classes to classes of these pre-service teachers who were just about to graduate or just about to um, enter their student teaching semester. And I would ask them if they had heard of the term digital citizenship. And it was crickets. It was absolutely crickets. But in our college, we were preparing teachers, trying to prepare them as best we could to really utilize and integrate technology into their curriculum. Yet our student teachers were unequipped to answer the question, what is digital citizenship? So I always like to start there. And it's it's fun to know how far we've come since then. Oh, I'll tell you one little quick other anecdote. I walked into one class. It was a secondary education class. Again, they were just about to go into their final semester of student teaching. Asked the question, do you know what digital citizenship is? And one young man raised his hand and he answered the question. He said, you know, I've never really heard that term before, but if I had to take my best guess, I would say that maybe it's an online course that you can take to become an American citizen. So again, you know, I just, I love to kind of start off with that question and just find out what people know about it. And there's some misconceptions, but Kristen and I came together um, really recently, like probably within the last six months, and we are starting our own collaboration. Um, And we came together because we both see this current need and this growing need for both digital citizenship and media literacy education that really empowers students as healthy, conscientious, and adaptive digital decision makers within digital communities. But we also know that a lot of teachers, uh, current teachers and new teachers, they haven't really been well equipped to provide high quality digital citizenship education. Um, Even those teachers that are working in schools that have robust technology access, there's still, you know, a lot of schools and and districts are still lacking that that piece for really robust digital citizenship education. And so because of that lack of preparedness and everything, we, Kristen and I see a lot of schools and districts out there who who do what they can along the lines of digital citizenship education, um, but a lot of times that means they do it as a standalone subject. Um, it might get relegated to a computer lab teacher, or it might get relegated to a library media specialist and nobody else talks about it. Um, and so often, digital citizenship education has become sort of a list of don'ts, you know, like, don't do this with your technology. Don't go there. You know, stay away from from this stuff with your technology. It becomes a list of don'ts. And so Kristen and I really want to flip that script. And we think about digital citizenship education in some different ways. I'm going to pass the ball over to Kristen to talk (laughs) more about that. Yeah. And it's it's funny that you... um... Leanne, you had said that so often it's the library media specialist that gets sort of stuck being the digital citizenship teacher. My background is uh, a library media specialist, and probably six or seven years ago, all 32 of our library media specialists got pulled together in our district 
And we were told, hey, we have to teach digital citizenship. It's, uh, it's a legal requirement. We don't know what we're going to teach. We don't know how we're going to teach it, but we think you guys can be the ones to do it. And we were told to kind of go out and see what we could find, try some lessons out with our students, and then come back um, to kind of report on what we found. And like Leanne said, um, so much of what was out there at the time was really restrictive. It was a lot of rules about things that kids shouldn't be doing with technology. Um, and it really kind of flew in the face of a lot of what I believed as a librarian, which was that students should be empowered to uh, explore information, that students should be empowered to make quality decisions um, for themselves. And so I really got into this digital citizenship space at the opposite end, um, where I wasn't really happy with what I was seeing and I wanted to change that message. So Leanne and I really believe in teaching digital citizenship in a way that empowers students as uh, not only digital age learners, but also community members. We know that our students are entering into digital communities um, with friends that they know from school, they're gaming together, they're, you know, exchanging snaps, they're on TikTok with one another. And we also know that eventually they're going to become these global citizens where they're entering into communities um, outside of the little face-to-face -face circles that they already have. And we really believe that the best way to um, empower our students as these global citizens is to embed digital citizenship throughout the curriculum so that it isn't just the library media specialist <clears throat> kind of having these conversations. It isn't just a lesson that's happening with the computer teacher. These um, topics and lessons are really integrated into the curriculum and throughout the instructional practices. So all the work we're doing right now is really focusing on helping schools and districts embed digital citizenship and media literacy into their culture and their curriculum uh, in, in more um, natural ways. All right. So I want to, I'm, Ray, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to take us way off course here because I, I get excited about the digital citizenship. I think it's extremely important. You know, you're talking about them being uh, citizens within their communities and then the global. And, and I'm a firm believer that actually, I mean, that that is the real world at this point, whether we like it or not, and, and where our kids are growing up and for them to be able to understand how to not only act in there, be safe in there, find the right information in there and contribute properly to that world, I think is so crucial. Um, and so, and I love how you're talking about how it, it does, it needs to be embedded in things, just like we've talked about embedded in 21st century skills, soft skills, or whatever you want to call them. This is something that needs to be embedded. So brings me to the question and either one of you can jump in on this or share whatever, but how, can you give us an example? Just like one, two examples, like how do we embed this in? How do we make this natural in our instruction, everyday instruction, our everyday uh, culture throughout our school? How do we embed these, these practices, these lessons uh, so that our students are continue are getting this not just like you said from one or two people or classes, but throughout everything they do within our districts. Yeah, for me, I think it's giving those really authentic opportunities to practice these skills with the guidance of uh, an adult mentor and with the support of their peers. <clears throat> I remember teaching uh, eighth grade language arts years ago, and I thought it would be really cool to do a cross building literature circle. So I. Uh, partnered up with a teacher across the district. We had our kids reading the same books. And back then we were building on wikis, which are really old school platforms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we had our students trying to like build out these web pages around the books that they were reading and doing it all doing it all virtually. And what I came to realize is that I needed to spend a lot less time focusing on um, maybe not less time focusing on the skills that they needed as as readers and writers and um, you know, sort of like critiquers of these of these novels, but I needed to spend just as much time teaching them how to communicate uh, on a digital team and how to, um, you know, collaborate with someone who they were never sitting in the same room with. These were things that my eighth graders had never had to do before. Um, and in the same way that I would explicitly teach them how to find symbolism in a novel, I had to explicitly teach them what it looked like to set a schedule and to collaborate virtually. Um, and so as opposed to just kind of talking to kids about what that looks like, I think we need to give them more and more opportunities to actually try it. Try it out, have that adult mentor, have those peers to support them. And that can happen in so many different content areas. Um, language arts is just the one that kind of came to mind for me. Lindsay or Leanne, anything to add? Yeah, well, I was just going to add, 
just tell you a little bit about what Kristen and I, one of the projects we're working on right this second that sort of relates to your question. So right now, Kristen and I are working with a district. In fact, we were, we just met like for the past two hours prior to hopping on with you guys. And we're developing out a scope and sequence that includes um, digital citizenship, media and information literacy and technology schools from K to 12, but we're embedding the content standards, the ELA standards, the ISTE standards, and the social studies standards that align. So when you start thinking about those content area standards and how digital citizenship lines right up with that, um, it becomes a lot easier to envision how we can fit this in without it being one more thing. So I'll just give you one example from, from the work that we've been 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 doing today, actually. So when we think about this, this digital citizenship idea of our digital identities, um, the data tracking that, that we know happens online, you know, when I have this conversation about something and then all of a sudden I go to social media and I see an ad for that thing, right? Um, this data tracking, our online activities, the, the things that we click on and how that creates our digital environment. And our, and our, and our bubble, our filter bubble, how those things worked. Well, then I look over at the social studies. So, so, so that, hang, let me back up. Sorry. So in digital citizenship, we might say that it's important for our students to understand that our digital identities and our data and our online activities are actually commodities. Then we look over at the social studies standards and we see um, an indicator that says, understand the basic elements of a community's economic system, including producers, distributors, and consumers of goods and services. So we can wrap up how our data becomes um, a commodity and a good and, and how that wraps up into the economics of technology companies, and it becomes an integrated social studies and digital citizenship lesson. Yeah, and social studies really is like such a natural place to make those connections. I remember when um, Twitter was shutting down different accounts this summer and people were like, oh, my gosh, the First Amendment, freedom of speech. How can Twitter shut down the president's, uh, you know, Twitter feed? And and just hearing, you know, social studies teachers kind of talking about the differences between you know, freedom of speech and that being a government protection versus a private company like Twitter and what they can do with uh, with information and access. And so I, I think that teachers are already having so many of these conversations about civic engagement, about what it means to, to be a human in a community. And what we're really trying to push teachers to do is to is to think about how those same lessons extend now into digital spaces because our communities aren't just relegated to our classrooms or our towns anymore. Yeah, Kristen and I were just talking about that with the the whole uh, propaganda, right? So what do you think of when you hear the term propaganda? Well, most of us think about World War II, right? Like we think, Kristen, you, you know what that yeah, I mean. <laughs> I do. I'm laughing because you're asking them questions again, like you're the host again. I know, I know. So that's why I said Kristen, because I'm like, oh, I'm not supposed to ask them. <laughs> I'm not the interviewer here. That's right. Right. But we but we know that propaganda plays such a big role in our in our digital spaces right now. And when we think about news literacy and media literacy, information literacy, um, and, and bias and all those things that we're experiencing in these digital spaces, that again just shows how these skills have always traditionally been taught and how we can so easily layer these digital spaces and really um, modernize uh, those aspects of education. I'm, I'm loving it. I love the connection with the, with, with the social studies and, and the economics and just, I, I just, I'm loving all of that. So um, I want to dive in. One of my favorite questions is talking about failure and how we're, how we learn from it, how we grow from it. It's something that I always talk about. I'm very fortunate to have failed a lot because I learned from that. And I, I still pull lessons from things that were 10 years ago. Um, and so I'd love to hear both of you just share a, a, a quick story with us about a time that you've ran into a failure or a challenge you've had to overcome. Kind of take us there with you. What happened? How did you overcome that? And then what'd you pull away from that experience? Gosh, this is tough. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I could go back in time and apologize to like all of the first groups of students that I initially taught because I failed so often back then. Um, but I think about how 
many times I just kind of asked or expected students to do things that were on a screen and assumed that because they were on a screen, the kids would have no problems doing those things. Um, I go back to that literature circle assignment again, and I think about all of my kids who were really high achieving, amazing readers, writers, speakers, listeners. And when I put them into this new environment, how many of them failed? And that failure wasn't on them. Looking back, that was a failure on my part, right? I did not model and layer and scaffold all of these skills that they needed to be successful in a completely new space. Um, and so I take that that group of students with me and some of their little crying eyes like, oh, what do you mean I didn't pass this assignment? Um, but I think about that in a couple of ways. Like first, we have to stop making assumptions that if it's on a screen, a kid knows what to do with it. Um, there are so many skills that students need to be able to navigate the digital world. There are so many skills that they have that I don't have and there are skills I have that they don't have. And so I think we have to be willing to like learn with our students, learn from our students. Um, but we also have to take the time if we're going to ask students to create something digitally, produce something digitally, we have to take the time to teach those skills in the same way that we're teaching our, our math, our ELA, our social studies uh, and science skills. Leanne, did you have anything? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I can certainly think of a time when I failed. I think back to when I was teaching um, in higher education in the College of Education, and I, I was teaching that three credit standalone course where you're supposed to learn how to, you know, our students are supposed to learn how to integrate technology, which is really ironic since it's a standalone course about integration, but that's beside the <laughs> And I remember there was like a week in that course dedicated to digital citizenship. And I dreaded it. Everyone who taught this course dreaded it. And everyone who took the course dreaded it. You know, we, we wanted to get back to the, the, the sexier stuff, digital storytelling. And well, it was back then, Kristen creating wikis and doing all this collaborative work. We wanted to get back to that. And this digital citizenship unit was just kind of like really a thorn in all of our sides. It was a box we had to check. And the reason why it was a box we had to check is because we didn't really understand it. Um, and, and I'll tell you that the, the, the entirety of the content of my digital citizenship unit was on copyright law. That was the entirety of my digital citizenship unit to pre that is, teachers. That is the opposite of sexy, Leanne. You're right. That is the opposite <laughs> of sexy. And I'm a librarian and I don't even like copyright law. <laughs> Um, but you know, you can even make copyright sexier, right? When we think about yeah. intellectual property, um, intellectual property is a lot more sexy than copyright, I think. True. But, you know, at any rate, that was a failure. That was a failure on my part. I failed my pre-service teachers in really um, shaping their thoughts about how they can shape their future thoughts about what it means to be a citizen in this ever evolving digital world. Like I failed them on that, that aspect when I just did some really boring lecture, probably on, on copyright law. So that was a big time failure. I know better now. <laughs> I have to say, it's kind of nice to hear that you both have failed at some point in your life. Cause there has been so many good suggestions and tips and stories so far in this episode that it kind of like humanized you both. I'm thrilled to hear that you both have like, you know, encountered hurdles and overcome them. This is, this is good for me. Cause I've been a little intimidated. You have so much knowledge you've shared on this. I literally could listen to you for hours. No kidding. Uh, well, thank you. I suppose. <laughs> and no, it's good. Except for, you know, like Kristen, you picking on Leanne about, you know, not being sexy with copyright law. Like that's, that's, that was, that's epic right there. Um, so it's interesting. You guys have already shared. So much insight. And I can only imagine the people that are sitting back listening to this episode thinking through like, wow, I thought I knew what digital citizenship was. But now we've really dove into the dynamic elements and, and the pieces that I might be doing currently in my classroom with digital citizenship that I don't even know I'm doing because I'm seeing a need and I'm filling it. And oh my gosh, it's so nice to hear. Wow, I am supporting the need for students to get these skills but I want to move into a piece of advice. And I know it's really tricky. I'm going to let you each kind of choose your piece of advice, Leanne. I'm going to go to you first. But I would love to hear 
one piece of advice, whether it be about digital citizenship or just the work that you've done as experts in the field, as incredible educators, what advice do teachers really need to consider that you want to leave them with in this episode? I think my piece of advice would be really short and sweet and simple, and that is listen to our students, listen to our young people. Um, our young people are using technology in ways that we're not, and they're connecting with people using technology in ways that we're not, and they know things. They know um, they're, they're aware of certain dynamics. That, that I haven't even experienced. I, right before the pandemic, I actually sat down with a bunch of like fifth graders through eighth graders. I did a series of like six or seven focus groups with, with fifth to eighth graders. They were all divided out by grade and, and gender. And I started asking them about how they use technology and what they, the strategies they use and what they notice about the dynamics. And I learned a lot. And so when we stop talking and telling kids, what to do and what to, what not to do and what not to post and all those things. When we really sit down and get curious and listen to their experiences about digital life, um, they have such rich things to share with us. So that would be my advice is, is, is get curious and listen to our young people. Oh, I love that one. My advice kind of goes right along with that. I would say that in addition to being curious and to listen, you know, I, get a lot of questions from parents in my community, um, you know, neighbors, friends. And oftentimes they want to know, like, you know, Kristen, how do you decide what apps your kids are allowed to be on? Do you use privacy settings? Do you track your kids' social media use? You know, how, how should I handle this whole thing um, with allowing my kids to be online? And I would just remind teachers that even though our students have a lot of knowledge and perspective about digital life, as adults, we have knowledge about relationships and conflict and problem solving and collaboration. And those are the those are the stumbling blocks that our kids are still experiencing when they are both in face-to-face situations and in digital situations. And so we have to stop and listen, but then we also have to remember that, you know, we might not know the the coolest uh, apps and games and, um, you know, TikTok dances and all that other stuff, but we have a lot of um, support that we can offer to our students. And, and that's why digital citizenship really just needs to be this ongoing conversation. It can't just be a one and done. We have to continually talk with our own children and with our students um, to help them navigate this digital world that they're in. Oh, I'm loving it because it, it's listen to them having this conversation. But it's a, it's a collaboration, right? We all have to continue to collaborate with our with our students, with the young people, with our friends, with our family, with society, so that we can be all be better at being good digital citizens. So, loving all that. Before we get into the six questions that I'm going to throw at you really fast, uh, you both you, you you were talking. We were talking earlier about how amazing you are, and you want to do a, a little bit of a giveaway. Do you want to talk through what we're going to give away today? Yes. I would, I'll go first and then I'll let Leanne talk. <laughs> um, so I just uh, published a new book, Jeff, by um, ISTE. It is called Ethics in a Digital World. And it is sort of a what's next in digital citizenship education, for me anyway. Um, it really challenges teachers and students to kind of start to think about the ethical implications of all of the different technologies that we use each and every day. Uh, as consumers. But then I also know that our students are going to go on to be the producers of of the next big technologies. And so I want them to have the skills to produce amazing technology, but I also want them to have some of those ethical mindsets to produce amazing technology that benefits society. So I would like to do a giveaway of uh, that book. I'll sign it. I'll mail it off. Um, We'll just have to figure out uh, the best way to get it off to people. And then... Leanne has something that she wants to talk about too that we're going to give away. Right, so, from our so collaborative- are we doing? Are we going to do two separate, or someone going to win like both Ooh. of these, like the ultimate prize? Ooh, what do you think, Leanne? I kind of like the ultimate prize idea. I kind of like it too. Let's look. Let's Me look too. someone up. All, All right, right, Leanne, what, what are we adding to it? Prize. So the second part of this ultimate prize is the product of Kristen and I's very. I don't want to say our first collaboration. We actually collaborated before this, but um, our collaboration from about four or five months ago, and I'll give you a little bit of the story. We, Kristen and I were talking 
Um, and we both sort of admitted kind of on the, on the sly to each other <laughs> that people had asked us both individually to come and talk to parents about technology do's and don'ts. And we admitted to each other that this really wasn't our jam, that we really kind of weren't comfortable in that role for a lot of reasons. Um, we didn't feel comfortable coming in and invading, not invading, but you know, like kind of invading a school community that we weren't a part of to tell parents like what they should do. And we sort of discussed why we were uncomfortable and, and the fact that we really believe that all families are different and they need to, um, they'll, they'll make unique decisions about the technology decisions in their home, um, just for a variety of reasons. So then we started like envisioning and dare I say, like dreaming about what would a family engagement event look like in our minds, like the ideal family engagement event around digital citizenship and digital life. And then we made that. And we offered, <laughs> we made, we did, it, we made, it. made it. all the materials. And so we put together this concept and it's a concept where families and students come together and they do lots of fun activities to explore digital life together. If you think of what like a school literacy night or a school math night looks like, families don't come in to learn how to read. They come in to read together or do reading activities alongside their children. And that's what this digital citizenship family event concept is like. And so we've created these different activities. We've created the, mater the materials to implement them. We've created a framework for how it, how it, how it looks in like a 90 minute session, but it can also be done in a virtual setting. And it's a digital kit that we offer. So I think we're also going to give away um, a subscription to the digital citizenship family night event kit. Nice. We get the we get the kit and the the book. All right. So what we typically do is have to have people go either to Twitter or Instagram. So, uh, Leanna, Kristen, are, is are you are you more active on Twitter or on Instagram? Twitter. All right. So we'll go Twitter. So you're gonna go on Twitter and make sure you use hashtag Teach Better hashtag Teach Better uh, Talk and and tag Kristen and Leanne. I'm going to give their, their handles here in a, in a minute. And then what we, we'd like to do is just ask, we, we need to ask a simple question, something they can answer in a single tweet, doesn't do it too crazy, but just a, a simple question or something they have to post to show us that they're interested in this. So do we have something, maybe a, a, a direct question that they can answer for us in a tweet? I would I, say, ooh, go ahead, Ray. What do you got? Are you sure? <laughs> I really, I love the question that Leanne posted at the very beginning. I think we can circle back to that. Like having people share when they hear digital citizenship, what they think I, of, what or like an example of work they're doing in this space. I think it's great to kind of amplify people's interpretations of it, but also the celebrations they have in that area. I love that. I agree. I, I like that too. All right, so head over to Twitter. Make sure you hashtag Teach Better and Teach Better Team. Tag us, Teach Better uh, Team there. Um, and answer the question, what do you think of or how do you define digital citizenship? And uh, we're going to be given a, a copy of Kristen's book, signed, sealed, delivered to you. Yes. And then there, di the digital citizenship uh, family event kit. Is that how it's? Did I say, did I say yeah. that right? I think I did. All right, cool. That's awesome. I uh, appreciate you both so much for doing that. Let's let's keep having some fun. We're, we're going to do these next six. And I'm going to throw these questions at you. Your goals answer each one in 15 seconds or less. So I'm going to give you, I'm not going to give each of you 15 seconds. You can each no. have like nine seconds each. You got to be fast, Leanne. All right. You ready? Yep. All right. What is one ed tech tool? Uh, sorry, just so everyone listening knows, we're going Leanne first, then Kristen, right? Is that the order we're going to do? Yes. Okay. What is one ed tech tool you cannot live without? Google Docs. Uh, Google Jamboard. Uh, give us a book you're reading right now. <laughs> I'm reading a fascinating book called Framing Internet Safety, um, which is part of a series on digital media and learning, author Nathan W. Fisk. But if I might, I would say the book that I just finished was this incredible book called Ethics in a Digital World. <laughs> <laughs> she got paid to say that. No, she didn't. Um, I am reading <laughs> The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff. Uh, who do you need to follow on Twitter or Instagram today? Besides us. 
We would encourage you to follow uh, at Digit PLN, which is the ISD Digital Citizenship PLN that we are both part of, um, at Online Bullying, which is uh, an amazing research tank uh, that shares all sorts of great data all the time. And then we'd also encourage you to follow at Jay Casa Todd, who's Jennifer Casa Todd. She was our ISD Digital Citizenship PLN Educator of the Year winner this past year and she does all sorts of great digit stuff too uh what's a good youtube channel website or podcast for educators to check out yeah we have three here we have rabbit hole from the new york times that's one of Kristen's very favorite she talks about it all. so good <laughs> so good um uh, what Kristen? oh go ahead oh no go ahead Okay, Note to Self is another one of my favorites. Uh, it's Manusha Marodi. And then Reply All from Gimlet. And these are all really great podcasts that kind of talk about that intersection of tech and humanity. Give us a daily, weekly, or monthly routine every teacher should get into. I think any of the habits that sort of interrupt that mindless scrolling that we all fall into that zombie state, anything that we can do to sort of break that. So whether that be device free dinners, whether that be habits about charging phones overnight in a place outside of the bedroom, whether that includes morning routines that, that are screen free, anything we can do to, to break that habit. I love it. And what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? <laughs> you, do you have one, Leanne? I don't think that I do. You go. Oh, oh, okay. So mine, I got my best piece of advice while I was trying to write my dissertation. And somebody told me that you can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. And so um, every time I get like a super huge project uh, like in my brain, I'm not afraid of it because I'm like, you know what? You can only eat an elephant one bite at a time. I'll just do a little bit of this project every day. And that's how I've managed to write a couple of books and um, do really fun work with Leanne. I love that suggestion. I think that that is one of my favorite pieces of advice that we've heard because at, regardless of what project you see as an elephant, right? One mm -hmm. bite at a time, it allows all of us to get through it. I love that focus. I mean, I don't know who's eating elephants around here, but it's, yeah. it's good advice. <laughs> good advice. Oh, my goodness. We do not condone eating elephants here on Teach Better Talk podcast. We just want to make sure that everybody hears us say that. However, the concept of a big elephant does create quite a visual. All right, guys, we want to make sure that everyone that listens to the podcast gets connected to you, the work you do and where they can find more information. I know that there are a lot of places they can connect with you. But if you could give us just the simple spots that they can that our network can go and continue to consume all your greatness, where would you like to start with that? Uh, you can check out the work of our collaborative at um, evolvelearning.com slash doctors. We are also both on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Clubhouse. You can probably just search our names, Lee and Lindsay, Dr. Kristen Matson, and kind of find us in those places. Um, Leanne, anything else? I think you covered it. Awesome. I love it. You know, you can find all the links and resources and everything we talked about in this episode over at teachbetter.com, as well as the really important links for connecting with both Leanne and uh, Kristen to continue this conversation and continue learning and growing with them. So make sure you head over to teachbetter.com for all of that. Be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any upcoming episodes. And if you can give us a rating and review, really appreciate that as well. Let's keep taking this just one step further. Think of just three of your colleagues who need to hear these amazing stories and connect with these amazing educators and just share this podcast with them. Oh, wow. Uh, Leanne, Kristen, this was such an incredible episode. I'm super excited. I, I'm so I, I'm so excited about the work you do. We've had these conversations. I, I'm really excited that you are so passionate about it and, and pushing to teach more and more people about this and get this into more and more schools and make it just part of what we do rather than a separate thing. That's super excited for me and super important. So really appreciate you sharing your story, all the work we do, you do, and just taking some time to hang out with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank the you opportunity. So and until next time, let's get out there and let's teach better.